Dark Cast Network, Indie Pods with a Dark Side. Welcome back to Fuck That. Before I get into this week's episode, I'm doing a giveaway. So if you happen to leave the podcast a rating on either Apple Podcasts or Spotify, Apple Podcasts, you can leave like a written review. That's not necessary, just a rating. And I'm not telling you what to rate me either. Just leave me a rating of your choosing. And the first 10 people that do that, If you feel comfortable, send me a screenshot on social media. All of the handles are linked in the show notes or an email, and I will be sending the first 10 people podcast stickers. And thank you to everyone that has already done so, to everyone that has been a subscriber and welcome, and thank you to everybody that is newly subscribed. I say this a lot lately, but I am genuinely thankful for all of you. The podcast has been growing a lot, and I still can't believe that people fucking listen to me, but I love all of you. Before I get into the episode this week, I'm just going to say trigger warning for the whole entire episode. I'm going to be talking about the Long Island serial murders, and this is going to be a very heavy episode from start to finish, so please just keep that in mind when listening. Oak Beach is a small private community that is tucked away from the rest of Long Island. The community is miles and miles away from any hospital, police station, grocery store, or convenience store. It's very secluded and only has 27 homes. It isn't uncommon for the Oak Beach community to have issues with flooding, and much of the area has thick marsh that grows almost as high as the trees. The largest marsh area in Oak Beach actually spans across 49 acres. The entrance to this isolated community is protected by a gatehouse, which is armed by an electronic keypad keeping any unwanted visitors at bay. The Oak Beach community did their best to remain a laid-back, easygoing, problem-free area where nothing bad ever happened to the residents. But as hard as they tried, this community would become the center of an investigation that uncovered a grim discovery that would forever haunt not only Oak Beach, but New York State as a whole. Before I continue, I just wanted to note that every time I'm talking about New York throughout this episode, I am referring to Long Island. However, there are going to be a few instances at the end of the episode when I'm talking about Manhattan but I will specify Manhattan. But from here on out, when I'm talking about these various locations, they are all located within Long Island. And for those of you that maybe aren't from the tri-state area like I am, or maybe you're from a different country other than the United States, Long Island is a very densely populated island located in the southeastern portion of New York State. And it stretches kind of from New York City along the Atlantic coast. And maybe you've heard of some of these, I guess, kind of famous state parks. There's Fire Island, Montauk, and Jones Beach. I'm not from Long Island, so if there are any Long Islanders listening, I did my best with that description. Please do not come at me. On November 1st, 1993, a 31-year-old woman named Rita Tangretti was last seen hitchhiking in East Pachogue, New York. Rita was a sex worker. Her remains were found on November 2nd off of a parkway in North Shirley. Rita was strangled and beaten. On November 20th, 1993, the remains of Sandra Castilla were found in Southampton, New York. 20-year-old Colleen McNamee was last seen on January 5th, 1994. Colleen was seen getting into a small blue car at the Blue Dawn Diner in North Shirley. Colleen, like Rita, was a sex worker. Her remains were found on January 30th. On April 20th of 1996, legs wrapped in plastic were found along Blue Point Beach on Fire Island. 
Unfortunately, at the time, the victim could not be identified, and she became known as Jane Doe No. 7. On June 28, 1997, in Lakeview, New York, near Hempstead Lake State Park, an unidentified female torso was discovered inside of a Rubbermaid container. The woman was identified as a young African-American female that had a tattoo of a peach with a bite taken out of it on her left breast. Unfortunately, this woman could also not be identified, and she became known as Jane Doe No. 3, and due to her tattoo, she was also known as Peaches. On November 6th of 2000, a torso wrapped in garbage bags was found in Manorville. At the time, the woman could not be identified, and she was known as Jane Doe No. 6. Similar to the torso that I had just mentioned, partial remains were found, which entailed a torso in Manorville again on July 26, 2003. The remains were identified as belonging to Jessica Taylor, who was a 29-year-old sex worker. All of these unsolved murders that occurred on Long Island between 1993 and 2003 remained a mystery for the community. These murders left investigators puzzled, and it left the residents on edge. And it was not until the disappearance of a young woman in 2010 in the private Oak Beach community that the spotlight was once again cast upon these deaths almost 20 years later. Shannon Gilbert was a young, intelligent, and driven young woman who excelled academically, graduating high school a year early. Shannon aspired to become a singer, but she really had a passion overall for the performing arts. Shannon was born on October 24th in 1986 in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, but she grew up in Ellenville, New York, which sits about halfway between Manhattan and Albany. Ellenville was a small and quiet town, and because Shannon wanted to be a singer and work in the performing arts, she really needed something that was more geared towards that. So in 2007, she made the decision to relocate to Jersey City, which is just across the bridge from Manhattan. To allow herself to pursue her dreams, Shannon began waitressing overnight to pay the bills, and this allowed her the flexibility to attend auditions during the day. However, when the auditions began to dwindle, Shannon decided to enroll in college and she began taking courses. Unfortunately, it wasn't long for Shannon to begin to struggle earning enough money to pay the bills and to continue her education. This general area has historically always been a very expensive place to live. Because of this, Shannon began to engage in sex work, working for a local escort service known as World Class Party Girls. And Shannon found herself quickly earning anywhere between $500 to $1,000 per night. In spite of this change in her profession, Shannon remained very connected to her family and frequently returned home to Ellenville to spend time with them. Shannon only intended to work as a sex worker until she was able to complete school. While Shannon worked for World Class Party Girls, she crossed paths with a driver named Alex Diaz. And oftentimes, sex workers, or in this case, escort services, would have people that were drivers. And it's essentially just an extra layer of protection for these people that are working as sex workers. An extra set of eyes in the area kind of ensures that they're safer compared to if they were to go out on their own. So Shannon meets Alex, who's a driver, and then they develop a romantic relationship. But unfortunately for the two, their love story took a very dark turn as the business that they were involved with ended up being shut down by the police. The relationship became abusive, leading Alex to an event where he broke Shannon's jaw, and this necessitated the placement of a titanium plate into Shannon's jaw in order for her to recover properly. After the escort service was shut down, Shannon resorted to advertising her services on Craigslist under the name Angelina. Shannon obviously kept safety in mind as she made this transition, and she would either rely on her boyfriend Alex most of the time 
as the driver, or occasionally she used another driver by the name of Michael Pock to accompany her while she worked. And again, this precaution is something that's just necessary due to the inherent dangers of sex work. Quickly, just to specify what I mean by that, because I'm going to be talking about this later, what I mean by sex work, obviously there's various forms, particularly we're going to be talking about out calls. So out calls are when a sex worker speaks to whomever they arrange to meet and it's outside of the location where they may live, they may be staying. So they are traveling to a different location. This is going to be the theme of this episode. And that is where you really see, obviously, the driver coming into play because they're going to a location that they may be unfamiliar with. On May 1st, 2010, after completing calls in the city, Shannon received a request to visit a location she had never been to before, Oak Beach, Long Island, that private community I talked about in the beginning of the episode. Shannon arrived at Oak Beach with her driver, Michael, shortly after midnight as they approached the community gate. The John who reached out to Shannon, and that's another term I'm going to be using throughout the episode. That's just a name for the man that made the call. So the John. So the John that had made the appointment with Shannon ended up meeting her at the gate and Michael decided to park and wait nearby. Typically, when Shannon booked appointments, she would book out for an hour But Shannon extended this particular appointment to two hours because of the distance that she and Michael had to travel. It was over an hour each way, so she made the appointment longer. While waiting for Shannon, Michael fell asleep, and around 4 to 5 a.m., he was awakened by the John banging on his window seeking assistance. The John claimed that Shannon refused to leave, and he told Michael that he legitimately needed his help to get Shannon out of the house because she just wouldn't leave. It was this whole big to-do. Michael wasn't sure what to make of this because this was something that was completely out of character for Shannon, and so some assumptions are going through his mind, like, what did this guy do? But as he walked into the house, he discovered that Shannon was hiding behind a couch in a state of sheer panic. Michael obviously approached Shannon to try to talk to her, and he noticed that she was on the phone with police. During this call, Shannon was saying, quote, they're trying to kill me. Being the only two men in the house, Michael and the John, Michael was very confused by that statement, according to his account. In a sudden burst, Shannon bolted out of the house, which prompted Michael to head towards the car. According to Michael, he assumed that Shannon would get in. However, Shannon continued sprinting through the neighborhood, desperately banging on doors and pleading for assistance. Keeping in mind that it's after four or five in the morning at this point, eventually an older man opens the door and he later described Shannon as panicking and begging for help. And according to what he states, as soon as Shannon caught sight of Michael's lights approaching the house, meaning as soon as she saw the lights going from straight down the road to kind of curving towards the house that she had approached, she fled quickly once again. Later that morning, when Shannon's boyfriend Alex woke up and realized that Shannon wasn't home yet, he contacted Michael, and Michael told him about the events that happened earlier that evening. Michael claimed to have searched for Shannon, but He stated that when he couldn't figure out where she was by sunrise, he gave up his search and returned home. Michael told Alex about the John, who was named Joe Brewer, and Alex asked Michael to connect him with Joe. Alex ended up calling Joe, who also told him about the events that transpired that night. And this prompted Alex to drive to Oak Beach later that evening to speak to Joe face to face. Alex was understandably anxious about the encounter, so when he drove there later that night, he decided to speak with Joe at the gate instead of entering the community and entering Joe's property. During the conversation, Alex made it clear that he intended to involve the local police in this matter, and surprisingly, Joe seemed to be unbothered, claiming that he had nothing to hide. Alex asked Joe to show him where the nearest police station was, And Joe ended up accompanying Alex to the police station. 
However, according to accounts, after the two men went into Suffolk County Police to speak to them about Shannon's disappearance, the authorities did not take them seriously at all. They seemed to treat the situation like a joke. What's important to understand about that night is that Shannon ended up making a 23-minute long phone call that night to 911. And additionally, residents of the area made 911 calls themselves, including the man who spoke to Shannon after she knocked on his door. But sadly, none of this was either tied together or taken seriously until later in her disappearance. On May 3rd, just two days after Shannon's disappearance, her mother Mary received a very strange and unsettling phone call from a man who claimed to be Dr. Peter Hackett. Dr. Peter Hackett has lived in the Oak Beach community for several, several years and was considered to be an integral part of the community because they were so far away from any doctor's offices or hospitals, and Dr. Hackett was an emergency room physician. So, According to residents, anytime anything happened, a cut, a scrape, somebody needed stitches, they would go to Dr. Hackett and he would take care of it. So Dr. Hackett was truly a steeple and well-respected figure in the Oak Beach community. However, according to Mary, Shannon's mother, the man called claiming to be Dr. Hackett and he asked about Shannon's whereabouts and whether she had made it home yet. Dr. Hackett informed her mother that he ran a home for troubled girls, and he claimed to have seen Shannon that evening. The alleged Dr. Hackett further stated that he had taken care of Shannon and administered Shannon medication to calm her down. That is so fucking creepy and not at all okay. Obviously, Shannon's mother Mary knew that something was up, and she was aware that her daughter would have not gotten herself into the situation. Immediately, Mary knew that something was up. She knew that Shannon would never allow a random man to take her in and administer her random medication. Shannon would never give some random stranger her mother's phone number. And after notifying authorities about this call, Shannon's mother and her family decided to visit Oak Beach and confront Dr. Hackett at his residence. I love this. Badass. Obviously, Dr. Hackett denied not only running such a home, but he also claimed that he never made that phone call. Eventually, police reached out to Dr. Hackett for further investigation, and when he spoke to police, Dr. Hackett maintained the same story during police questioning. He stated that he never made that phone call. In spite of all of these weird circumstances that surrounded Dr. Peter Hackett, police stated that they thoroughly investigated him and dismissed him as a suspect in Shannon's case. Seven months after Shannon's disappearance, on December 11th of 2010, a cadaver dog and its handler were conducting a search for Shannon near Gilgo Beach off of Ocean Parkway. Investigators were obviously hopeful that this was the body of Shannon so they could bring the family closure. However, when they went to identify the body, there was no titanium plate in the jaw. Thus, it was obvious that the body did not belong to Shannon. The police continued their investigation in the area, which led to the discovery of three more bodies on December 13th. All of the victims were women in their 20s and were all presumed to be involved in sex work. However, none of these bodies belonged to Shannon Gilbert. The Suffolk County medical examiner initially believed that the bodies had been in their respective locations for a year or longer. However, due to the presence of salt water as well as exposure to the wind, could have accelerated the decomposition process. Richard Dormer, the commissioner of Suffolk County Police at the time, oversaw the investigation and Dormer formed a task force that consisted of three supervisors and 12 detectives throughout the area that contained specialists in computer forensics and cell phone technology. Additionally, the task force consulted with the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit in Quantico for assistance. All of these bodies were found 10 to 30 feet from the parkway. Each body was found approximately a tenth of a mile apart, and all of the bodies were wrapped in burlap. Now, anybody that hears something like that, whether you have a law enforcement background or you're just an armchair detective like I aspire to be, 
you hear that and you think serial killer. The bodies are all the same. The same distance from the parkway, the same distance from each other. They're wrapped in burlap. They're all presumed to be sex workers. You automatically think that there's a tie. But in an effort to avoid causing unnecessary panic within the community, according to what Suffolk County says, authorities refused to use the words serial killer. I respect this. They did want to ensure that they made a legitimate connection before they made a declaration. But everybody in the area heard this and they made that assumption on their own. And obviously there was panic. The victims were identified in late January of 2011 as Maureen Brainerd Barnes, Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. Finally, on January 25th, Commissioner Dormer and Suffolk County DA Thomas Spoda officially acknowledged that these four victims were indeed the victims of a serial killer. Maureen Brainerd Barnes was the first woman of what became later known as the Gilgo Four to disappear. Maureen was born on June 14th of 1982 in New London, Connecticut. At the age of 16, Maureen became pregnant with her first child, which led to her leaving school to focus on motherhood. Later, she had her second child with her ex-husband. Following the end of her marriage, Maureen moved in with her sister seeking support and a fresh start. Circling back to her marriage, Maureen received her GED at the time, and she worked really hard for her daughter to make ends meet, even after the divorce. Maureen was described as a romantic, an artist, and a dreamer. Maureen was known to have a zest and passion for expressing herself through various creative outlets. She engaged in making music, which is my favorite fucking thing about her, by the way, She made a lot of different music and explored all genres, but at one point, she was really involved in writing poetry, and so this led her to start to try to write rap lyrics, and she eventually had a dream that she wanted to ghostwrite rap lyrics for really famous rap artists. I think one of the ones that I read about was 3-6 Mafia. I personally could never do that. I would probably be so bad at it that it would be beyond laughable. But, you know, I respect somebody that just lets themselves go through different creative outlets. So Maureen began to promote herself and her music on MySpace. And for those of you, and I know there's a lot of you because it's fucking 2023 that are too young to know what MySpace is. (sighs) I'm really jealous of how youthful and dewy your fucking skin is. Fuck you. I'm just kidding. I love you. MySpace was the exponentially cooler version of what Facebook dreams it could be. I guess in hindsight, it's kind of passive aggressive because I remember this always caused problems with me and my friends. You had like a top four, top six, top eight, top 24 friends list. And like me and my girlfriends would always fucking get pissed at each other. Oh, I'm not your number one. I'm moving you to like number 24. But what was cool about MySpace is you could play music, you could attach media players. So when somebody logged onto your page, you could have a couple of different songs queued up. One could autoplay when you load the page. So it's just a really cool version of Facebook. You don't get banned for calling somebody dumb and you could promote things on there. Sorry, I got off way off track, but MySpace brought me way back. So Maureen used MySpace to advertise her creative endeavors, which eventually led to her modeling. And Maureen quickly realized as she was motivated by making more money, as we all are, especially because she's a younger mother, realized that if she began nude modeling, she would make even more money. And so Maureen then transitioned to modeling after meeting connections on MySpace to nude modeling. Nude modeling subsequently led to Maureen pursuing sex work in 2006, and she was enticed by the potential financial gains that sex work could offer her. However, when Maureen embarked on this endeavor at just 24 years old, she quickly realized that she had no interest in working for an agency because, smartly, she realized, 
That would require her to share her earnings, and why the fuck would anybody want to do that, honestly? Maureen was determined to be independent, and she discovered an avenue on her own to promote her own services, using Craigslist. She utilized the Eastern Connecticut Adult Services section. Maureen posted ads initially in that area using the name Marie, which was her mother's name. So Maureen was working a lot in the Groton area, but she eventually saw a change due to a couple of different reasons, limited financial prospects, and her familiarity with the local community. It was uncomfortable for Maureen, as I think it would be for anybody, to encounter people that she knew due to the smaller size of Groton. Maureen decided that she wanted to venture into the world of casinos, and she started her work at Foxwoods, which is, if you're not familiar with the area, one of two of the casinos in Connecticut. Maureen had some familiarity with Foxwoods as she previously worked there as a card dealer. Transitioning to working out of the casino exposed Maureen to a wider range of clientele, including out-of-town visitors that had massive disposable incomes. As Maureen's earning potential grew, she expanded her endeavors into Manhattan, where the prospects for her financial success continued to increase. Although Maureen temporarily quit sex work in 2005 due to her second pregnancy, she did end up later finding work as a telemarketer at Atlantic Security in Groton, which was just basically a burglary security system company. She was let go, and after this, Maureen returned to working in Manhattan. Maureen Brainerd Barnes went missing on July 14, 2007. She was 25 years old at the time when her friend reported her missing to Norwich, Connecticut police. Maureen left on July 6 on an Amtrak train from New London, Connecticut to Grand Central Terminal. She was with a close female friend who returned home early on July 9 around 11.45 p.m. In the aftermath of her disappearance, Maureen's best friend received a strange call from an anonymous man a few days later. The caller intentionally blocked their number. The man claimed to know Maureen's location and said that she was, quote, at a whorehouse in Queens. Melissa Mary Bartholomew was born on April 14, 1985, in Buffalo, New York. At the age of 17, with just over a year left in high school, Melissa made the decision to move out on her own, eventually finding her own place while also working at a pizzeria. In spite of the challenges that came with living on her own, Melissa graduated high school with straight A's and shortly after she graduated, she pursued her passion for cosmetology and she enrolled at Continental Beauty School. After successfully completing her cosmetology education, Melissa began working at Supercuts, but this was just a stepping stone as Melissa had dreams of moving to the city to pursue a career in hairstyling and eventually wanted to open up her own salon in the city. Melissa took her first trip to the city in 2006 with her boyfriend at the time, deciding to move with Jordan, her boyfriend, not long after this trip. Not long after moving to the city, Melissa told her family that she found work at a salon owned by a man named Johnny, a.k.a. Blaze, who became her boyfriend. However, according to accounts, Blaze was actually a pimp, and this led to Melissa transitioning into sex work, keeping the secret from her family until 2007. In 2007, Melissa's younger sister, who was nine years younger than her, visited her in the city. They were incredibly, incredibly close, and Melissa confided into her younger sister about the work that she was in. Amanda kept this a secret on behalf of Melissa because she didn't want to strain the relationship with her family. Eventually, Melissa began to advertise her work on Craigslist under the name of Chloe. At the time of Melissa's disappearance, she and Blaze shared an apartment in the Bronx, and this is where she was last seen on the day of her disappearance. Melissa went missing on July 12th, 2009. On the night of her disappearance, Melissa had scheduled a meeting with a John. The night prior, she had called friends and told them that she had booked another $1,000 date on Long Island. One of her friends offered her a ride for safety, but Melissa decided that she was going to go on her own. 
Melissa was last seen sitting on the curb outside of her apartment on the afternoon of July 12, 2009. On July 18th, Melissa's mother initially attempted to file a missing persons report with police after not hearing from her, but police disregarded her concerns for several days. Again, this is always due to their work. It wasn't until 10 days had passed that an official investigation into Melissa's disappearance was finally initiated. And as part of the investigation, Melissa's phone records were subpoenaed to gather critical information. DNA samples were obtained from her toothbrush, and investigators canvassed Melissa's neighborhood in the hopes of uncovering any possible leads or witnesses. But thankfully for police, the examination of Melissa's phone records revealed that she had accessed her voicemail on the night of the 12th, the night she disappeared. Notably, and save this in your back pocket for later because this will come back up, the location of these calls were traced to a cell phone tower in Massapequa, Long Island. Similar to the phone call that Maureen's best friend received after her disappearance, and this is just trigger warning, this is really fucked up and just makes me really fucking mad, but around one week after Melissa vanished, similarly to what happened to Maureen, Melissa's teenage sister, who was 15, 15 at the time, began receiving a series of fucked up and offensive calls from a man that she believed to be the killer. And one of the biggest drivers of her belief that it was the killer was that these calls were coming in from Melissa's cell phone. The caller mocked her younger sister and was very vulgar and asked her really fucked up questions like, are you a whore like your sister? Over the course of five weeks, these calls escalated in their nature, with the unidentified man eventually telling her little sister during the last phone call that, yeah, I killed Melissa and I'm watching her rot. Again, she was 15 at the time. But thankfully, she made the right call. Immediately, these calls prompted her to inform the family of the work Melissa was doing, and this was then communicated to investigators. Megan Waterman was born on January 18, 1988, and she grew up in Portland, Maine. Megan began dating a man who had family in Brooklyn, New York. And in the spring of 2009, Megan made her first trip from Maine to Long Island, accompanied by her boyfriend. Several of Megan's friends believed that she was forced into sex work by her boyfriend who worked as a pimp. On May 13th of 2009, using the online alias of Lexi, Megan posted her first advertisement on the Suffolk County Craigslist, describing herself as, quote, new in town model type, end quote. Initially, Megan only engaged in in-calls, and those are calls where the John or whomever calls meets the sex worker at whatever location they are. However, eventually, Megan began to switch between in-calls and out-calls, eventually adopting the name Tiffany. Megan and her boyfriend briefly separated, and Megan remained in Maine until they reconciled the following year in 2010. On June 5, 2010, Megan returned to Long Island while her boyfriend was allegedly visiting family in Brooklyn. Megan checked into a Holiday Inn Express alone in Hopog, which is located across the Long Island Expressway. In the early hours of June 6th, Megan had conversations with friends and families mentioning that her boyfriend was out with friends and that she was really tired that evening and planned on going to bed. However, Megan posted an ad on Craigslist as Lexi shortly after midnight stating, quote, Jump into a world like no other. Please, no blocked calls or text messages, end quote. Hotel security footage showed Megan walking out of the lobby around 1.30 a.m. A witness later reported seeing her walking along the service road in the direction of a convenience store. The following morning, when Megan's boyfriend realized that she was not at her hotel room, he contacted friends and relatives of Megan inquiring about her whereabouts. When her boyfriend realized that nobody knew where she was, he then called the police to report the situation. 
and he provided a description as to what Megan was wearing that evening. But due to his criminal record, he did not stay to meet with the police in person and he did not follow up on this call. Amber Overstreet was born on February 10th, 1983, and she was the second daughter born after her sister, Kim. While the sisters were both born in Pennsylvania, they grew up in Wilmington, North Carolina, their family's original hometown. When Kim was in her sophomore year studying at the University of North Carolina at Wilmington, studying sports medicine, she crossed paths with an older woman named Teresa, whom she had happened to share a class with. Teresa owned a company called Coed Confidential, which employed women to provide companionship to men in various capacities. Teresa described Coed Confidential to Kim as being a unique organization. Each call was unique, and the women had the freedom to choose which calls they would take and which calls they wouldn't. It was through this opportunity that Kim became involved in sex work, and her younger sister Amber later followed suit. Teresa would host extravagant parties at her mansion for her employees, and these parties gradually became more intense and always involved the presence of drugs, which escalated as well. It was during one of these parties that Amber began using heroin. Eventually, Kim and Amber left Coed Confidential, which led them to explore other avenues, such as advertising on Craigslist. At this time, Amber had opioid use disorder, which stemmed from her exposure to heroin at these parties. Amber's pseudonym on Craigslist was Carolina. And during their work in the sex work industry, both Kim and Amber were almost always accompanied on their calls. And Kim and Amber lived together on and off in Florida and then in Long Island for five years. Amber and Kim resided together along with David, who I will mention shortly, when Amber goes missing. David was one of the men that often accompanied Amber and Kim during their jobs that they received. Dave happened to be in love with Kim at the time. Amber was seeing a man named Bear who also helped them in the way that Dave did. However, he was temporarily away due to challenges he was dealing with with substance use. After Bear goes away, Amber actually has a little bit of a challenge with her mental health, which is understandable when somebody loses their partner, be it temporarily or permanently. On September 2nd of 2010, Amber received a very early morning call sometime around 8 in the morning. Amber traveled into the city with Dave in order to acquire heroin. At the time, Kim, her older sister, was in North Carolina. Later, around 5 p.m. that same day, Amber posted an advertisement on Craigslist and she was contacted for a job that evening that offered $1,500. The John was scheduled to pick her up by 11 p.m. and she was set to return the following day sometime between 6 and 7 a.m. Dave walked Amber out of their home that they shared with her older sister, Kim, to the corner of the meeting in North Babylon, New York. Again, this is Long Island. But remember, Amber and Dave were using all day. So due to his impaired state from using, he was not able to register any of the details about the vehicle. All Dave knew was that Amber received a call from a John that was seemingly familiar. He walked her to the corner and everything seemed copacetic. Almost immediately when Amber didn't return, Dave called Kim, her older sister, in a panic, but Kim reassured him not to worry. And I'm not saying this so that you have a negative opinion of Kim, because that was not Kim's intention. Kim and Amber were very free spirits. They both explored using substances, Amber more than Kim. So Kim genuinely believed that Amber was just out having a good time. This does not make her a bad sister in any way. It, she was just following her guttural instincts as to what happened to her sister. And at the time, she had no reason to worry. However, as more days continued to pass and Dave did not hear from Amber, he reached out to Kim again. And they were both concerned at this point, but they were very scared to involve the police due to the complex circumstances that surrounded their involvement in the sex industry and the fact that they both used substances. 
Kim went on to later state that she didn't file a missing persons report because she knew that it would not be taken seriously. I'm sure that there are going to be some of you that are going to hear that and think, wow, that's fucking stupid. But I implore you to think about every other individual that I talked about in this episode and the negative connotations that are associated with the life choices that they made. Kim's assumption is not very far-fetched. In fact, it is guided by fact. Historically, there is a stigma against not only sex workers, but people that have substance use disorder. You combine the two, and it is just exponentially worse. Now, these four women who later became known as the Gilgo Four, their identifications were made in January of 2011, but I want to go back to December of 2010. In December of 2010, police halt the investigation into Shannon Gilbert's disappearance due to winter, but this intensive search was resumed on March 29th of 2011, and police began to surveil the area along the Ocean Parkway, which is where these four bodies were found. And this spanned a seven and a half mile stretch from Oak Beach to the Nassau County line. This search effort led to the discovery of a fifth body on March 29th. But unlike the previous four, this body was located about a mile away from the others. The others were approximately a tenth of a mile. And this one was situated about 30 feet into the weeds, not along the edge of the shrubbery, which ran along the parkway. In the beginning of the episode, I mentioned a torso being found in 2003 in Manorville, which belonged to Jessica Taylor. And in these remains, the skull and forearm were found, which were able to be matched to the remains of Jessica Taylor originally discovered in Manorville in 2003. The discovery of this additional body let investigators know that this search needed to be expanded even further, and so they brought in more help. The FBI sent a Black Hawk helicopter as well as another airplane to use high-resolution cameras to perform flyovers. Authorities continued their investigation, and on April 4th, law enforcement found three more bodies within the 400 acres that was being searched. One body was not intact as police only uncovered the head, the hands, and the right foot. But thankfully, the police were able to match what they discovered to Jane Doe number six, who was originally discovered in Manorville in 2000. Thankfully, in 2020, investigators were able to identify Jane Doe number six as Valerie Mack. Valerie was a 24-year-old sex worker in Philadelphia who was last seen in the spring-summer of 2000 near Port Republic, New Jersey. The second body found was linked to an unidentified Asian male, and the third remains were linked to a toddler that was found wrapped in a blanket. Thankfully, there were no signs of trauma found on the toddler. This toddler was identified to be the daughter of Jane Doe number three that I mentioned in the beginning of the episode, who was also known as Peaches. The second set of unidentified female remains were known as Jane Doe number seven, and the unidentified Asian male remains were identified as John Doe. These subsequent discoveries deviated from the discoveries of the Gilgo Four, as the four women were placed approximately a tenth of a mile apart. They were wrapped in burlap and found along the edge of Ocean Parkway. Because these additional discoveries did not conform to this pattern, this indicated a deviation from the previous modus operandi which indicated to police that these were likely not linked to the first four bodies that they discovered. Between April and December of that year, police decided to make, in December, a last-stitch effort to hopefully find the remains of Shannon Gilbert, which is what started this whole process and uncovered all of these bodies in the first place. Thankfully for Shannon's family, to bring them some closure, On December 13th of 2011, 
Shannon Gilbert's body was discovered. Earlier during the investigation of her disappearance, Joe Brewer, the John, and Michael Pock, her driver, were thoroughly investigated, as well as Dr. Hackett, but they were all ruled out as suspects by the police. The focus then shifted for investigators to finding a connection between Shannon and the other victims, and a link was obviously established between Shannon and the Gilgo Four, as they were all women in their 20s, their early 20s. They were all young, vibrant, and petite. They all worked as sex workers. But most importantly, all of these women advertised their work on Craigslist. Something to note about Dr. Hackett is that investigators were able to confirm that he was, in fact, the person that made the call to Shannon's mother, Mary, after her disappearance. When Dr. Hackett was confronted with the evidence, he changed his story, obviously, and claimed that he made the calls to, quote, comfort, end quote, Mary. However, investigators did not believe that, still, even in spite of all of this additional information, Dr. Hackett had any involvement in Shannon's disappearance or the serial murders. You're going to find out why in a bit. It's infuriating. Heads up. Like I mentioned before, Suffolk County Police conducted one last search in an attempt to locate Shannon Gilbert. And in December, this was almost two years after her disappearance, they decided to search the marsh at the center of Oak Beach. And investigators did this using an amphibious vehicle, which was equipped with a rotary mower to cut the trails in the marsh, and then investigators would follow behind. During the search, they found a purse, one shoe, a phone, and a pair of jeans in the marsh, all belonging to Shannon. Two days later, investigators found Shannon's nude body lying face up in the same area that she was last seen. Shannon's identification was quickly confirmed because of the titanium plate in her jaw. Now, the marsh that she was found in is marsh that covers approximately 49 acres, and her body was found about a quarter of a mile from where her belongings were located. What's important about this is this marsh area to the right and to the left behind Dr. Hackett's house. This is where Shannon's belongings were found, and a quarter mile away is where her body was found in the marsh behind his property. Remember how I told you you were going to get fucking pissed when I told you that investigators didn't believe Dr. Hackett was involved? I didn't say that because they didn't bother to look into him. To be quite frank, I don't know, and I don't know if anybody knows how thoroughly they investigated him. I mean, he's a prominent ER doctor. He was a prominent ER doctor in New York. So who knows? I'll leave it at that. But what's infuriating is this. After Shannon's body and her belongings were found, Commissioner Dormer stated that it had appeared that Shannon was heading towards the lights on the causeway in an attempt to leave the area and that they believed that due to her being on drugs and due to the late hour and her location in the marsh, that Shannon succumbed to the elements. Commissioner Dormer mentioned that she was likely under the influence that night and she probably entered the marsh unintentionally while following the lights from cars on the parkway. Remember how I told you that a lot of the marsh had thickets that were like almost the size of trees? I'm not sure who's going to enter that, regardless of how fucked up they allegedly are. Dormer suggested that Shannon probably tripped over a drainage ditch and drowned in less than three inches of water, which makes sense. When Dormer was pressed as to why Shannon's belongings were found so far away from her body if she wasn't murdered and she, quote, brought this upon herself, Dormer said, well, it's because she was hysterical. She obviously discarded the items as she moved along into the thickets of the marsh with mosquitoes and whatever else. Dormer further stated that her jeans probably came off as she moved through the dense marsh. 
I listened to this press conference and you can find it online. And I was already well aware of the stigma that was against sex workers and people that struggled with substance use. But man, after watching this man speak about Shannon's disappearance and then eventually uncovering that it was her death, I couldn't help but reflect more on what Kim said, Amber's older sister, as to why she was so hesitant to go to police. Society does not take sex workers seriously. And I am sincerely hoping with the recent developments of this case that this is something that changes, even if it's just marginally. That's a start for now. Almost six months after Shannon Gilbert's body was discovered on May 1st, 2012, Shannon's family met with the chief medical examiner at Suffolk County headquarters to discuss the new findings in the medical report. Initially, it was suggested that Shannon may have died from exposure, and this is what Suffolk County really honed in on, but that couldn't be confirmed. And during this new meeting, the family went in with hope that this would be disproven or that they would be given some kind of concrete answer, but they were told that they still had very limited information about what happened to Shannon and the cause of her death remained unclear. The conditions of Shannon's remains when they were found posed challenges regarding the determination of her cause of death. While Shannon's skeleton was mostly intact, there were some bones missing, including some finger and toe bones, but most importantly, two-thirds of her hyoid bones. For those of you that are unfamiliar, the hyoid bones are bones that are found within the neck, and they are very critical in determination of whether or not somebody was strangled, especially in this case. Because two-thirds of her hyoid bones were missing, this did raise the possibility of strangulation as the hyoid bones can become loose easily under the circumstances of somebody being strangled. However, without the bones being found near or on the body, they were not able to examine them for any signs of damage. Therefore, a definitive conclusion could not be reached. Shannon's family was also seeking closure about whether or not she was under the influence of drugs at the time of her disappearance and subsequent death. Obviously, there was a lot of speculation surrounding her case based on the fact that Shannon was a sex worker and based on the fact that it was implied that her death was due to natural causes because she was in some kind of hysterical state. So, Understandably, her family wanted to disprove the rumors that she could have been under some kind of drug-induced psychosis. It's what any one of us would also want to do if that was a relative of ours. Here's what's odd about this, though. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, so I'm not saying that there's anything nefarious to this. It could have just been... I don't know, maybe they were feeling lackadaisical that day. I'm not implying anything by this, but it is kind of weird that the medical examiner's office did attempt to test marrow from one of Shannon's femurs for the presence of drugs, but they couldn't locate any bone marrow, therefore they couldn't test. So, instead of testing for bone marrow elsewhere, we've got 206 Brain tissue and a clump of hair was used to test for cocaine only, no other drugs, and this yielded negative results. Shannon's family, which unfortunately is so similar to so many other families that I've worked with, did not feel like the Suffolk County Medical Examiner's Office did a thorough job in determining what happened to Shannon, or at least disproving some theories that people had. Shannon's case remains open to this day. In 
In 2013, a man named Timothy Bitroff was arrested and convicted on a contempt of court charge for violating a protective order. During this process, which is mandatory now, a DNA sample was obtained from Timothy and entered into a criminal database. It was discovered that Timothy's DNA partially matched evidence found at the scenes of the murders of Rita Tangretti and Colleen McNamee. This development led investigators to focus on his brother John, who was a married carpenter residing in Manorville. If Manorville sounds familiar to you, it's because it's the same location where the torsos of Jessica Taylor and Valerie Mack were found. And these torsos were found, maybe not coincidentally, it's unclear, but only three miles from John's home. Police eventually obtained his DNA, which turned out to be a match. John was subsequently arrested in 2014, and on July 5, 2017, he was convicted for the murders of Rita and Colleen. John received two consecutive sentences of 25 years to life on September 12th. During his trial, the prosecution clearly stated that John is a suspect in at least one of the 10 other murders attributed to the Long Island serial killings. For those of you that watch the news in any capacity, there have been additional and substantial updates regarding these serial killings. On July 13th of 2023, an architect by the name of Rex Hewerman was arrested at his office in Midtown Manhattan near the Empire State Building. In January of 2022, the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office formed a team of investigators, analysts, and prosecutors to collaborate with various law enforcement agencies that included Suffolk County, New York State Police, the Suffolk County Sheriff's Office, and the FBI. This team's objective was to conduct a comprehensive review of all of the evidence and information related to the investigation of the Gilgo Beach murders. Again, these were the four women that were initially found when investigators were searching for Shannon Gilbert after her disappearance. During this renewed joint investigation, a significant breakthrough occurred on March 14, 2022. A first-generation Chevrolet Avalanche registered to none other than Rex Hewerman was discovered. This finding was critical because a witness to the disappearance of Amber Costello had identified a first-generation Chevy Avalanche as the vehicle associated with the alleged perpetrator. So this discovery of the vehicle prompted an extensive investigation into Hewerman, which involved the execution of over 300 subpoenas, search warrants, as well as various other legal processes to gather evidence against him. During the investigation, cellular records for Hewerman were obtained, which revealed connections to various aspects of the case. These records corresponded to the cell site locations related to the burner cell phones that were used to arrange meetings with three of the four victims, as well as the calls made to Melissa Bartholomew's younger sister, a call made by a detective to Melissa's cell phone during the investigation, and calls that were checking voicemail on Maureen Brainerd Barnes's cell phone after her disappearance that I mentioned earlier in the episode. Moreover, it was discovered that Hewerman resided in Massapequa Park. If that sounds familiar to you, it's because we've talked about it many times in this episode. It is the same area from which a lot of the victims were believed to have disappeared. Additionally, Rex worked in Midtown Manhattan near the vicinity where the taunting phone calls were made to Melissa's younger sister. These connections, along with other evidence, led investigators to believe that Hewerman was the individual who used the burner cell phones to communicate with each of the four victims prior to their disappearances, and also utilized the cell phones of Melissa Bartholomew and Maureen Brainerd Barnes after their deaths. Just to quickly 
recap, Maureen's best friend received a phone call that Maureen was, quote, at a whorehouse in Queens, end quote. That is the call that they are referring to. So these burner phones were connected to Midtown Manhattan, coincidentally where his office was, and Massapequa where he lived. Investigators knew that these murders were linked as the cause of death for all four were homicide. All of the four were murdered in the same fashion. They were placed in proximity to each other between 22 to 33 feet from the edge of the parkway, arranged similarly. They were all petite females between 22 to 27. They were all sex workers. They all had missing clothes and or personal possessions. And they all had contact right before their disappearance with a burner phone. All four of the bodies were bound by belts or duct tape at the head, chest, and legs. And all of them were wrapped in camouflage burlap. There is a document that I've linked in the show notes, which is Rex's appeal and denial for bail. Thank God. And in these documents, this is where I'm getting all of this information from. At the time that I am recording this episode, Rex is only being charged with murder in the first and second degree for the murder of Amber Costello, Megan Waterman, and Melissa Bartholomew. However, in this document, and investigators have stated that they believe that he will be charged as well for the death of Maureen Brainerd Barnes. I'm going to begin with the evidence against Rex regarding Maureen. Reiterating, Maureen Brainerd Barnes was last seen on July 9th of 2007 in New York. She was contacted by a burner phone on the 6th, so three days prior to when she was last seen. Between the 6th and the 9th, there were 16 interactions between Maureen's cell phone and the burner phone. The last location for Maureen's phone on the 9th was around 11.56 p.m. near the 59th Street Bridge in Midtown. This is in Manhattan. This is approximately, and I mapped this myself, this isn't in the document, everything prior was, this quick little blurb, I mapped it. This is about three miles away from Hewerman's firm, which is called RH Consultants and Associates. But what's important about these three miles, at least to me, is that the direction is towards Massapequa, Long Island, where he lived. Now, the rest of what I'm going to say is from the document. That's just my assumption based on Google Maps and what the evidence says. The document states that the burner phone traveled from Massapequa to Manhattan on July 10th, which checks out because it's a Friday. So likely Rex is traveling from his cozy little home in Massapequa towards his firm in Midtown Manhattan. What is interesting is Melissa's phone traveled from Midtown to Massapequa that evening with the last location pinging at 1.43 a.m. on the 11th, which is now a Saturday, making an outbound call, checking her voicemail from a location in Freeport. Freeport is six miles away from Massapequa. It's closer to Manhattan than Massapequa is. So the, it's, it's closer to the main boroughs compared to Massapequa, which is like farther out on Long Island. All of these phone calls that were made to Melissa's family, her younger sister, they were all made from Midtown Manhattan, not far from where Hewerman owned his own firm. Megan Waterman was last seen at the Holiday Inn on June 6, 2010, around 1.30 in the morning, but she was contacted by a burner phone that was activated earlier that day on June 5th. Again, 1.36 in the morning, so same, same fucking day. This was when she was last seen, and after that, there was no more activity on the burner phone. None. Megan's phone activity, however, showed that she traveled to Massapequa Park, where Hewerman lived. What a strange coincidence. Last pinging around 3.11 in the morning, near his home. Amber Costello was last seen leaving her home that she shared with her older sister Kim and Dave on September 2nd, 2010. 
she was contacted by a burner phone on September 1st, and that burner phone pinged near Massapequa Park at 12.05 in the morning. On September 2nd, the day that she was last seen, according to witnesses, a John showed up at Amber's home. And after the John entered the home, a ruse, which Amber was known to do, and I'm not saying this to diminish or insult her in any way, I'm just stating that's something that does happen from time to time in her line of work, and she was known to do it. So they would conduct a ruse where a man would come in. It would either be the boyfriend or not the boyfriend, and they would be very upset at what she was intending to do. And they would retain the money for the services, but no services would be given, and then the John would leave. Based on what witnesses say, this is what happened that day, and the John was described as a large white male, approximately 6'4 to 6'6 six, six in height, in his mid-40s, with dark bushy hair, big oval 1970s type sunglasses or eyeglasses, and one witness described him to police as appearing like an ogre, which I'm not going to post them because fuck him, but if you do look at pictures of this guy... He does look like an ogre. What's even more damning is a witness noticed a first-generation Chevy Avalanche parked in the driveway of the residence. And according to this witness, after they conducted that ruse, this client said that he was just her friend. Tell her I'll give her a call. And he left. According to witnesses, around 1.18 in the morning on the 2nd, after this ruse had happened, the burner phone belonging to Hewerman sent a message to Amber's phone that said, that was not so nice to do. I want credit for next time. Phone records show that the burner phone was located in Massapequa Park within two minutes of this message being sent. According to a witness later that day on September 2nd, Amber was again contacted by the same John that was in the house that night before with the Chevy Avalanche and that witness stated that Amber said that the John wanted to see her again, but he didn't want to come back to the house because of her boyfriend. So the day she went missing on September 2nd, around 9.30 in the evening, the same burner phone from the previous evening communicated with Amber. During this communication, the burner phone used a cell site that was located in Midtown Manhattan that traveled to Massapequa Park contacting Amber at 10.39 p.m. and 11.05. Cellular records for the burner phone indicate that around 11.17 p.m. the phone traveled to West Babylon, which is where Amber lived. If you remember earlier from the episode, Amber left her home with her friend Dave walking her to the corner that evening. Amber made the decision to leave her phone behind because she felt comfortable. And shortly after she left her home, a witness observed a dark colored truck pass the house, specifically coming from the direction Amber had walked towards. Unfortunately for his wife, Hewerman was married, but thankfully, according to cell phone records, his wife was either out of the country or out of state for three of the disappearances and murders. I don't know if it's undetermined for Maureen, who they implied. He was going to be charged for or what, but at least for three out of the four, she does not appear to be connected. So I just want to note that and just make it known that she is not being charged with anything. So as far as we know, she is also a victim. Now, I want to quickly go over his records during the time of the victims' disappearances and murders. Hurman's architectural business in Midtown Manhattan was the subscriber used for his cell phone. That was registered, though, however, to his home address in Massapequa Park. Cell phone records and American Express records indicated that Hewerman was often located in the same general areas as the burner cell phones used to contact the victims, so Midtown Manhattan or Massapequa, as well as when their cell phones were used to check voicemail and make those calls after the disappearances and murders. There were no instances found where Hewerman's location differed from these other cell phones during any of these communication events. I'm just going to say that I really feel like they did a good job at putting together the pieces of the puzzle because that is a very fucking damning piece of evidence. 
the investigation also uncovered multiple accounts online and burner phones, more than one. I think it's up to seven or nine. Don't quote me on this. All held under fictitious names and used for illicit activities. There's more people. American Express records revealed recurring payments to Tinder made by Hewerman using one of his burner cell phones that was subscribed to the name Andrew Roberts. This cell phone was connected to an AOL email account registered as a John Springfield. Not adding up, obviously. Call records and cell site warrants indicated the extensive use of these burner phones for sex work-related contacts with frequent activity in, you guessed it, Midtown Manhattan and Massapequa Park. Investigating this further, authorities revealed a connection to another burner account. The email address is thawk080672 at gmail.com. This was subscribed under the name of Thomas Hawk. Fucking clever. Not? This was used for searches related to sex workers, sadistic pornography, and child pornography. Now, trigger warning, I know I said it in the beginning, I'm going to say it again. If you really want to read through this list, you can find it online in the bail decision. I'm not going to read through it because it's just so fucked up. And even though this is what I do, I have a fucking limit. And my limit is at things that have to do with children. So I'm not going to read through the list. But I'm going to read through some and trigger warning. So again, just reiterating, these are his searches. Pretty girl with bruised face porn. That's self-explanatory. Torture, redhead porn, tied up and raped porn, nude slave girls. There's a lot. I I don't want to elaborate on too much because it's, you can paint a picture, but I wanted to give an example. So the same email account conducted 200 searches between March of 2022 and June of 2023 that were specific to the disappearances and murders that he is being charged with. And it includes, I'm not going to read through them all, there's so many, but why could law enforcement not trace the calls made by the Long Island serial killer? Why hasn't that serial killer been caught? Uh, Long Island serial killer update 2022, serial killers by state 2023, currently active serial killers. He searched for John Bitchroff who I mentioned earlier and can go fuck himself, both of them, quite frankly. He searched for Megan Waterman, Melissa Bartholomew, <laughs> Maureen Brainerd Barnes, which this is like a very Israel Keys, who I plan on covering eventually. But I mean, he didn't do it directly like this, but he would search for his victims in very roundabout ways. So it's just the same narcissistic kind of tendency. It's just, it's just, upsetting. Additionally, he searched for relatives that are redacted, and I'm not going to name them. He searched for Cops Launch Gilgo Beach Homicide Investigation Task Force. Just this guy obviously would suck his own dick if he fucking could, but probably can't because it's not anatomically possible. And he likely also has a micro penis, if any at all. So Lastly, the fictitious AOL account that he had revealed selfies that were taken that were obviously of Huberman and were obviously really unsettling and just gross and just fucking weird. And they were linked to the burner account used to make the account. Investigators were then able to put the nail in the coffin and uncover surveillance footage of Huberman on May 19th of 2023 buying additional minutes for the same fucking burner phone at a store in Midtown Manhattan. I fucking love a good investigation, man. I really do. Lastly, I want to get into the forensics that were mentioned in the document, starting with Maureen, who, again, he has not been officially charged for her murder in the first or second degree, but they have implied that it is going to happen. So Maureen was restrained, trigger warning, by three leather belts. One was used to bind her feet and ankles, and upon examination of the belts, a female hair was recovered from one of the buckles. This DNA was identified as likely belonging to the same individual or someone closely related to Hurman's wife. Again, she was not in town or in the country for these events, and she has not been mentioned or implicated in any way. 
It is very easy, especially considering females and how much we shed for a roomie or a partner or whoever lives with us to have our DNA, especially our hair on another person without their knowledge. So please don't take this as incriminating her for the crimes. It simply links him to the crime because that is who he lives with. Regarding Megan, she was bound by duct tape and two human hairs were recovered. And again, they were identified as likely belonging to the same individual or someone closely related to his wife. Amber was also bound by duct tape. And again, female hair was recovered specifically on a piece of tape inside the camouflage burlap. And the same conclusion was made. Investigators were able to recover a hair from Megan which was directly matched to Hewerman after investigators gathered his DNA. I fucking love this. They gathered his DNA from discarded pizza on January 26th, 2023. A swab was taken from the crust. And on June 12th, 2023, the mitochondrial DNA profile concluded that the profiles between the crust and the hair were the same. When Hewerman was arrested on July 13th, he had the burner phone linked to the Thok email account on him. This piece of shit demon from hell was charged with murder in the first and second degree for the death of Melissa Bartholomew. On or about July 10th, 2009, Megan Waterman, on or about June 6th, 2010, and Amber Overstreet Costello, on or about September 2nd, 2010. He was rightfully denied bail. Michael Brown, Hewerman's defense attorney, stated in a press conference that Rex Hewerman told him through tears that he was innocent. Hewerman is likely to be charged with Maureen Brainerd Barnes's murder. I want to briefly go back to the tragic disappearance and death of Shannon Gilbert. Unfortunately, This tragedy did not end with her death. Mary's third daughter, Sarah, faced many challenges in life that were worsened following the traumatic death of her sister. After an incident in January of 2014, she was hospitalized and then hospitalized several times again subsequently. She was eventually diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Sarah struggled with her mandated treatments her mental health, and with substance use. On the morning of July 23, 2016, Sarah had called relatives for help after a sleepless night. She had been hearing voices again. Her mother rushed over to help her, and ultimately, Sarah murdered her mother. She was found guilty, and she's currently serving a 25-year sentence. I hope that this tragedy that this family continued to face after Shannon's death lights a fire under investigators to finally uncover and talk about the truth as to what truly happened to Shannon. But for now, while Shannon's death remains a mystery, Shannon's legacy goes beyond her fate. Shannon's disappearance reignited the public's interest in unsolved cases and thus set in motion a chain of events that led to the discovery of additional victims. The search for Shannon Gilbert ultimately became a catalyst for reopening investigations, uncovering the identity of Jane Doe's, and solving some of these murders that went unsolved for decades. Shannon Gilbert's disappearance contributed to shining a light on the darkness that had plagued Long Island for years. Shannon gave hope to those affected by these heinous crimes and reaffirmed the community's commitment to seek justice and to hopefully continue to seek justice for those victims whose crimes remain unsolved. If you liked what you heard today, please subscribe, leave me a reading wherever you follow and listen to the podcast. You can find me everywhere on all social media and YouTube at fthoughtpod except for Instagram. It's at F that underscore pod. And don't forget to check out the website. It's still a work in progress, but I have a lot of the cases worked up as well as a place where you can find merch 
And that is www.fthatpod.com. <laughs>